So when we look at the NFL draft, certainly without delving deep into the USC personnel, Drake London was the first game uh, name that came to mind for me and the remarkable season that he had. So I think we start there in regards to USC's draft coming up on Thursday. No question. So I have a I have a definite feel or at least a definite prediction. I have, might very well be wrong, but like I solidly feel that he's going to go at number eight to the Atlanta Falcons. And the reason for that is very simple. Calvin Ridley got suspended for betting on NFL games. So Atlanta has this big yawning gap in its wide receiver room. They need an elite guy to take Ridley's place this season to pair with Kyle Pitts and Drake London is that guy. So I think that's just a great team fit meeting a specific situational need. So I'm going to call my shot for Drake London going number eight to the Falcons. And then in terms of moving beyond London, I mean, Drake Jackson is being mocked late second round uh, generally. Uh, I, so, you know, who knows which team in like, you know, the late fifties or early sixties is going to get him. I don't know about that, uh, but that's probably where Drake Jackson's going to be. And, that brings up, you know, one of the big stories about this draft is that USC fans, they're not really excited about this draft, but they're they're realizing that, hey, this is the last Clay Helton draft we have to deal with. And the difference between the Clay Helton draft classes and the Pete Carroll draft classes is not the first round because we've seen Elijah Vera Tucker and Austin Jackson go in the first round the past few years. It's in the second and third rounds, day two. Top 100, Pete Carroll stuffed the top 100 with lots of picks, which is what Ohio State and Alabama and Georgia and LSU regularly managed to do. USC had been doing that. It stopped doing that under Clay Helton. So this is the last draft in which we have to deal with this storyline. But like after Drake Jackson going you know, around number 60, give or take five or six spots, there's no other projected top 100 pick. Uh, you have guys in the secondary, Isaiah Polamau, uh, Isaac Taylor Stewart, Chris Steele. They're all mocked either, you know, in the lower end of day three, uh, you know, like 175 or lower or being undrafted. You might get Jalen McKenzie, the offensive lineman in round six or seven. Uh, Keontae Ingram, same thing, might get him in round six or seven. Uh, I, you know, I think he should be drafted. I'd take him. I think he passes the eye test, but I know that a lot of draft experts aren't very high on him. The big note about these guys, particularly in the secondary, uh, who might go on day three at best, the thing to remember is that Talanoa Hufanga, the safety who went, I believe, around uh, number 180, somewhere around there to the 49ers in last year's draft, well, he really impressed with the 49ers in year one. He scored the touchdown on special teams in the uh, divisional playoff upset of the Green Bay Packers. So he made himself into a very useful NFL player in year one. He has a bright future out there in San Francisco. So he wasn't taken very highly in the draft. There was skepticism about his speed. There was also skepticism about the quality of coaching that he received uh, from Todd Orlando, the de then the defensive coordinator. He was able to transcend that. So for USC fans watching in here on the Voice of College Football, if you see Polamau, Taylor Stewart, and Steele uh, not get drafted or get picked lower than you think they should have been, um, just remember, like Talanoa Hufanga has already shown that where you get picked doesn't really matter. If you have the goods and you just get your shot, you can prove yourself in the NFL. So the Hufanga example really uh, should be something that Steele, Taylor Stewart, and Pola Mao all uh, take into consideration uh, before this draft. Ufanga is a perfect example of what I was citing earlier. Uh, when I would watch USC play on defense, I would see individuals stand out. He's one of those guys that would stand out regardless of the lack of tackling technique that you would see, blown coverages, all the issues that are related to coaching, you would see the recruiting come through with the four or five or six standouts that they would have on defense and they would freelance as individuals and make big plays and look impressive individually, uh, you know, in isolated instances. And he's one of the guys that came, came to mind, certainly. Absolutely. Like you didn't see a very good structural defense from USC, but you did see guys who just had an instinctive feel for the game in ways which, you know, 
exactly. They transcended coaching. Like he, Tufanga had a nose for the ball, knew where to be, knew where to go. And, you know, so the questions about his speed were min- were minimized, at least in terms of, you know, believing that he could be a good NFL player because his instincts are so sharp. And those instincts predated any of the coaching that he received at USC. It's exa- It exactly fits the paradigm that you just outlined. I believe he's the one that make a, a tremendous break on the ball against Utah and save the game with a game-winning interception, game-saving interception a couple of years ago at the Coliseum. 